disappeared among the yellowing trees. So yellowing, even here, is a sign of decay. Right? So what, what time of month is it? Fall. Fall, right? It's time things start passing, start, start dying, right? No telephone message arrived, but the butler went without his sleep and waited for it until 4 o'clock, until long after there was anyone to give it to if it came. I have an idea, an idea that Gatsby himself didn't believe it would come, and perhaps he no longer cared. If that was true, he must have felt that he had lost the old, warm world, paid a high price for living too long with a single dream. He must have looked up at an unfamiliar sky through frightening leaves and shivered as he found what a grotesque thing a rose is and how raw the sunlight was upon the scarcely created grass. That's a terrifying sentence. Tell me what it means. I'm going to read it again. So, right? Nick just says, he imagines Gatsby realizes he paid a, a price, a price too high for living too long with, a, with only one dream. Does that make sense? He's looking up at the sky for like the first time, and he's like, I paid a really high price for this dream. He must have looked up at an unfamiliar sky through frightening leaves, so we have unfamiliar frightening, and shivered as he found what a grotesque thing a rose is. Is a rose grotesque? No. What would make a rose grotesque? Yeah. Huh? It would die. It would die. And how raw the sunlight was upon the scarcely created grass. Explain this to me. What's going on? Everything's decaying. Everything's falling away. Right? Eventually, everything passes. So this is Nick's imagining. A new world, material without being real, where poor ghost. Poor ghost? What does that mean? Yeah, what does that mean? Breathing dreams like air. Or ghosts. Um, People who are in uh, <laughs> Well, it, it could just, yeah, it might be the souls of people who, with unachieved dreams, right? Oh, Yeah, just dreamers, right? Breathing dreams like air drifted fortuitously about, like that ashen, fantastic, ashen, reference to the Valley of Ashes, that ashen, fantis, fantastic figure gliding toward him through the amorphous trees. Who's that talking about? Wilson. Wilson, that ashen, fantastic figure gliding toward him through the amorphous trees. So, um, the chauffeur, he was one of Wolfsheim's protégés. Heard the shots. So who hears the gunshots? If you hear gunshots, what do you do? Uh, okay. So people have different reactions. So the reaction here is, afterward, he could only say that he hadn't thought anything much about them. If I hear gunshots, I'm not just going to keep talking. <laughs> I'm probably going to call 911, lock my door, put a bookshelf in front of it, and attempt to jump out the window. Do you want the dress shots you came from? So, probably. End of real quick. Um, so, this is hint number one that something is not right. Possibly. This is an interpretation, right? The chauffeur, Wolfsheim's protege, right? The guy who's going to follow in after Wolfsheim. Heard the shots, didn't do anything. I drove from the station directly to Gatsby's house, and my rushing anxiously up the front steps was the first thing that alarmed anyone. 
So when was the first time anyone was like, hmm, maybe something's wrong? Oh, wait. When Nick came, came running. When Nick came running. <laughs> yeah, because nobody picked up the phone, right? But they knew then, I firmly believe. They knew what? He did it. That he's dead, right? I, he says, I firmly believe it, that they already knew. With scarcely a word said, four of us, the chauffeur, butler, gardener, and I hurried down to the pool. So there's four people there, and only one person heard the shots, and it's like, no, no big deal. So right there, we need to ask ourselves, who really killed Gatsby? OK, Wilson was there, definitely. But could, have been a, could it have been Wolfsheim? Wolfsheim? I mean, Wolfsheim ordered so. it. Maybe. Maybe it was ordered by Wolfsheim. Wolfsheim was supposed to protect him, Wait, but... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Murder. Yeah. Um, also, I think it's interesting here that... Wait, I have a question. You know, this idea that he is... He is living... Um, Where's my note? That's in the gas in record nature. All right, I don't know where I put my that note, but we have this idea here of what time of year is it again? Fall. 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 What is he trying to? What is he doing? Oh, oh. No, um, Gatsby decides to go swimming, oh. right? Oh. So, yeah, it, well, from the book, we believe that it's fall. So, Gatsby, so even on page 153, sorry, this is where my note is, it's, he says, I'm going to drain the pool today. And I say, Gatsby tries to defy the passage of time. So I jumped back to page 153. It says, Gatsby tries to defy the passage of time, time and cling to the past. Even as autumn leaves are beginning to fall, he wants to let the servants clean the pool and decides to swim as if it were the heat of the summer. If Gatsby had been in the house and not pursuing hobbies out of season, things might have gone differently. Where's that? Where's that? I mean, it, yeah, definitely foreshadowing. Page 153, it connects with 161. Um, All right, so even like his pursuits are out of season. OK, keep going. Page 162. So we, we have that beautiful symbolism of like, him trying to repeat the past, and also the question of who really killed Gatsby. There was a faint, barely perceptible movement of the water as the fresh flow from one end urged its way toward the drain at the other. With little ripples that were hardly the shadows of waves, the laden mattress moved irregularly down the pool. A small gust of wind that scarcely corrugated the surface was enough to disturb its accidental course with its accidental burden. The touch of a cluster of leaves revolved. It slowly tracing like the leg of transit, a thin red circle in the water. It was after we started with Gatsby toward the house that the gardener saw Wilson's body a little way off in the grass, and the Holocaust was complete. So we've got a, I've got a few things that I want to point out here. That are all symbols, I believe. Um, so we already talked about the symbol of weather, right? Things are decaying. We talked about how Gatsby's trying to pursue a summer sport in autumn. The fact that Gatsby dies in water is not insignificant. You know it. The death scene is very much um, symbolic of 
Gatsby's pursuit of Daisy, right? This barrier between the two, right? In order to reach Daisy, he needed to cross this huge barrier, which ultimately he was never able to cross. Um, and in water, water is, it's something, it's this word called liminal, liminal place. It's a liminal place, it's always in movement. It's, it's never sitting still, there's always ripples, right? In all of Gatsby's activities, he was always moving, attempting, trying to move upward, maneuvering, trying to manipulate people, gain access with people to pursue his goal. Um, and so he was always in this state of flux. Um, and in this water, this water wasn't open, it was enclosed in a pool which is also very symbolic of Gatsby himself, right? He was never able to escape, right? He was always closed in. He was never able to free himself from that lower rung of society. The East Eggers, the ones who really control the society, are always in control. So he's never able to escape. Then there is this, the last line of the second to last paragraph on 162, it says a thin red circle in the water. So we've got this thin red circle, which is what? Blood. Blood. So streaming out of Gatsby's very own body is blood. And it forms a circle. And what do we know about a circle? It starts here and ends at, there. at the same place. And so this symbol of a circle kind of shows the the uselessness of all of his efforts in this liminal place, right? No matter how hard he tries, he's always going to end up back where he started, right? Um, he's going to go the way he came by being nobody to the rich. That's what I have there. Uh, then you have this word of, in the very last line, the Holocaust was complete. So we have this sense of a destructive slaughter, a mass on a mass scale. And so in Nick's eyes, you have this, it's a slaughter, a slaughter of victims. And so the fact that Wilson is included in the Holocaust, that slaughter, means that he also views Wilson as a victim, right? Because it's, not until Wilson is dead that Nick says the Holocaust was complete, right? And so this slaughter of the lower class due to the manipulations of the upper class. All right, any questions on this part? I think it's a, Fitzgerald's an incredible, isn't he? Like his writing is amazing. Yeah, every author is just a problem for having like their own book. Yeah, I mean, it's... All the symbol, even just digging into it, you're like, wow, I can't believe it's all here. Um, okay, I'm definitely skipped over a lot. Um, I just want to jump back to page 134. I'm going to jump back a few pages. I don't want to um, completely ignore, so we're on page 134, but the scenes prior, the scenes prior to page 134 is the, the scenes of Gatsby trying to get Daisy to tell Tom that she never loved him and that she's leaving him. But ultimately what happens? It backfires to Daisy saying, you're asking too much. I did love him. And then Tom starts to go on the attack. And if you're dating someone and someone's like, so if you're dating someone, and then another person starts attacking that person like, you're a murderer, you're a cheat, right, you're a thief, you're like, oh gosh, bye, 
right? Like you're just like back away. Right? And so that's kind of the scene that's happening here with Daisy. On page 134, she's, we see, he killed a man, blah, blah, blah. It passed, and he began to talk excitedly to Daisy, denying everything, defending his name against accusations that had not been made. So not only is he defending himself, but what else is he doing? Fine. Defending his name against accusations that had not been made. He's guilty. He's saying more things than he needs to. Oh. Like, like, you killed a man, you're like, I didn't kill rape and burn down cities. You're like, okay, nobody said that, but thank you for telling <laughs> us. Right? <laughs> but with every word, she, but with every word, she was drawing further and further into herself. So he gave that up in only the dead dream. Isn't that quite a phrase? The dead dream fought on. Bottom of 134. The dead dream fought on. So at this point in the novel, the dream is over. It's dead. The dead dream fought on as the afternoon slipped away, trying to touch what was no longer tangible, struggling unhappily, undespairingly toward that lost voice across the room. So at this point, we've got two phrases, a dead dream and a lost voice. The dead dream belongs to Gatsby, the lost voice. Or the dead dream even is Gatsby, you could say in many ways, right? He was a dreamer. The lost voice is definitely who? Right? It's, it's incredibly tragic. It's heart-wrenching. Um, so we have the dead dream on page 137. We have the death car, which I think that passage is really descriptive. Um, this part right here about Myrtle, how she's dead. Michaelis and this man reached her first, but when they had torn open her shirtwaist, still damp with perspiration, they saw that her left breast was swinging loose like a flap, and there was no need to listen to the heart beneath. The mouth was wide open and ripped at the corners as though she had choked a little and giving up the tremendous vitality she had stored so long. So her breast is ripped open, and her mouth is torn apart, right? These parts, like it's torn apart. I, it's incredibly vivid, but I think just the graphicness of the grotesque death shows us the brutality executed on these people as a result of careless activity. All right. We're moving, we're moving. Um, page 145, the last three words on 145, we see that Gatsby is at Daisy's house. So we have the dead dream. He goes to her house, and what is he doing? He's watching over, over nothing. He's watching over nothing. So at this point, we really know it's over. On page 147, I'm moving quickly, sorry. On page 147, the light here, um, excuse me, okay, I'm just giving this phone to you. Um, the light here is definitely a symbol of Daisy and Gatsby's relationship. So, nothing happened, he said wanely. I waited, and about 4 o'clock, he came to the window, stood there for a moment, and turned out the light. So we see the finality of their relationship. She goes to the window and, bye. I don't have time to read the passage below where it says his house never seemed so enormous, but I will just pull out. We're going to ask, I'm now going to transition from, I'm going to transition to talking about the house. So I'm going to go from here to the end of the book. Um, the house is very much a symbol for the person that lives there. And we haven't really talked about the houses. But in this passage below, this paragraph, these are the words that describe the house. It's enormous, innumerable feet of dark wall. Innumerable means you can't count it, right? Feet of dark wall, so it's dark. There is a ghostly piano. 
inexplicable, meaning like you can't explain it, amount of dust. So you have ghostly, dark, 